Bom dia, Sara. Bom dia. Sara, bom dia. Consegues ouvir? Sim. Consegues ouvir?
Okay, good morning. Now we are starting the second phase of the Friday meeting at the Eastern. And the first one will be Damien with the presentation Blast World Characterization and the Improvement of Critical Infrastructure Safety. So, uh, hello everyone, and good afternoon, and thank you for coming to my presentation. Uh, I recognize everyone in the audience, but for those listening uh, online, uh, Damian Trigeremet. And uh, in my presentation, which we will start now, uh, I will give a brief uh, overview, background of the thesis. And then, as the thesis is divided in three big parts, uh, I also divided uh, the presentation in three parts. So the first part is dealing with laboratory mechanical testing, where I will describe <coughs> sandwich the panel technologies that we are studying, then how they were produced, because two out of the three configurations were produced manually, and then some laboratory testing, and then I will move to uh, blast testing, where I will show some previous configurations that were used at uh, University of Coimbra, then <coughs> my configuration, which is present, the instrumentation which we are developing for this um, uh, experimental setup, and then the last part, third part, is uh, uh, finite element model. <coughs> so, um, when we speak about accidental actions, uh, often it is also spoken about critical infrastructure. So, uh, c any system which uh, causes disruption or damage or uh, can cause a significant um, uh, negative consequences in general on, on the society and uh, in general is considered a critical infrastructure. So uh, those which I am going to focus on are energy sector and chemical sector, because they were in the past ten days, the time test years uh, in focus of uh, public. So there were uh, ship impacts on offshore structures in Azerbaijan. There was one explosion on the offshore jacket platform. Uh, and probably everybody remembers a big uh, uh, disaster in the port of Beirut, which was uh, in 2022, where the mismanagement of uh, uh, highly flammable and explosive material uh, in one of the um, uh, warehouses caused uh, more than 1,000 uh, uh, life losses, 10,000 people were injured, and hundreds of thousands of people were less home, left homeless. So it destroyed a vast part of the city. So uh, here I will have a case study on accidental actions uh, uh, offshore, so in the petrochemical industry, where we can see that the most uh, affected structure is a jacket platform. Uh, it had the highest number of uh, fatalities and also the highest number of fatal accidents. And then if we zoom into a jacket platform uh, lower, uh, we can see its operation uh, modes, uh, uh, accidents uh, uh, related to those operation modes, and then damage level is uh, related to each of the uh, accidental scenario. So, for example, in all of these operation modes, development drilling or repair work or production, in all of them, uh, uh, in all of the sequences related to them, uh, the highest damage level is related to fire and explosion. So we will, uh, as a case study, to see how is generally the uh, how the, the structures are generally protected uh, from uh, accidental scenarios and most precisely against uh, blast and fire. Uh, we will see uh, what is the common practice uh, in offshore uh, facilities. So here we are focusing on structural blast protection, but um, uh, the most preferred way to protect the structure is simply to keep the distance, like in uh, our own life, when there is a danger, if we are far away from the danger, nothing will happen. So if the personnel on board of a jacket platform or on offshore is uh, far, in, far away from the hazardous area, uh, there won't be much risk for the personnel. But as jacket structures are often uh, in, uh, on a limited area, uh, often the hazardous area is close to accommodation modules and uh, 
uh, evacuation routes, it is also necessary to design the structure for these, um, for these events. So what we have available for this, what is a common practice, is to uh, provide the ductile connections and also to design a special uh, claddings or blast walls to protect the structure from the blast impact. Uh, typically, it, what is used are thick uh, steel plates with, um, oh, here, with uh, stiffeners, or we can have a corrugated plate, which is then connected on with the um, L profile, dire either directly to the structure, or it has one intermediate uh, L profile to increase the ductility of the joint. But uh, recently, uh, recent studies show that sandwich panels have a much better um, capacity to resist uh, the blast impact. So, uh, after some literature review, uh, we focused here on three types of uh, sandwich panels. We have three different configurations. One is purely uh, metallic. So, we have, for example, a uh, steel face uh, of a panel and aluminium foam core. One is com like a hybrid, combination of a stainless steel uh, face and uh, aramid paper uh, honeycomb core, which is also known as Nomex honeycomb. And the third is purely fabric solution, so it's an aramid fabric uh, face uh, with a Nomex honeycomb core in a tandem sandwich form. Uh, so here, in this uh, part of the presentation, I will present how these uh, uh, panels are produced. So the steel and nomics were done, were produced, being produced manually. The third one is being produced manually, and the steel face and aluminium foam core came already as a, as a product. Um, and then I will show some uh, static and dynamic tests that were performed uh, in the lab. So this part, uh, we will start with um, aramid uh, fabric and nomex honeycomb core. And this uh, specific study was done during my uh, study visit uh, in Serbia uh, with a partner institute uh, from Belgrade, uh, Military Technical Institute. And there we experimented with uh, various types of polymer matrices. Um, we introduced um, different uh, ceramic uh, uh, nano reinforcements, also known as uh, engineering, uh, different engineering ceramics. We used titanium diborite, which is, uh, for example, given in this uh, specific uh, panel. But we also studied silicium carbide, or carbide, and we studied also Wolfram disulfide. So how we made, how we produced these um, uh, specimens? So first we had to measure the right amount of uh, uh, polymer matrix for which we used epoxy and hardener and polyvinyl butyrol. Polyvinyl butyrol we added in 5% uh, amount in order to increase the ductility of the polymer and uh, then we mixed uh, these two with uh, ethanol. On the mechanical stirrer we, uh, uh, in a certain procedure, uh, we further mixed the, uh, uh, the mixture and then applied over the fabric. Uh, so this step one also has a sub-step, uh, step 1a, in the case of panels that were reinforced with uh, uh, nanoparticles. And those specimens are shown here on the left. So as a final product, we have a panel which is uh, without nanoreinforcements. And we have a panel on the left, which is with our importance. So we can also see the cross-section of the two here on the picture below. Uh, this is the ongoing uh, uh, procedure. Uh, we are now trying to produce the um, steel nomics honeycomb core panels. Uh, for this, we are using the stainless steel uh, sheets. We are using, again, nomics honeycomb, which is here. Uh, epoxy matrix and hardener, uh, which are here mixed in a plastic bowl. And uh, as we will see in the results later, uh, we had to apply also one filler because the viscosity of the epoxy was quite low. So the bonding between the honeycomb and the steel plate was very bad. So we got slippage failure instead of shear failure in the honeycomb. So we here also prepared dog bone specimens for the epoxy. Here uh, is how we placed the plates in order to produce the lab shear specimens. So the idea is before we move to the production of a big panel, to produce uh, small specimens to test them in uh, shear, to see how well uh, 
the bonding uh, works between the honeycomb layer and the steel sheet. Uh, as I said, I did not show the aluminum foam panel because it, it came as a product, so there was no need to produce it. Uh, here are some samples of uh, a laboratory mechanical testing. So this specific, uh, for this panel with aramid uh, fabric and Nomex honeycomb core, we did three-point bending, compression, and sharp impact test. And here we can see the average curves for uh, specimens uh, with uh, nano reinforcements, which are which is the blue line, and the curve without nano reinforcement, which is the red line. Um, we concluded from the study that uh, adding uh, nano ceramics uh, improves the bonding between the faces of the panel and the honeycomb. Uh, we observe uh, in the non reinforcement specimen a small dent in every single of the, of the, of the specimens tested. And we also uh, experience uh, high delamination between the layers. Uh, none of the two effects are present in the reinforced sample. And we can even observe a nice curvature of the, of the specimen. Here we can also see the failure in the middle. If you zoom in enough, <laughs> uh, you will see the crack in the wall of the honeycomb. Uh, this is a compression test, and here we have uh, three types of specimens. So this is a pure honeycomb here. Uh, this is a sandwich panel without nano reinforcement, and third one is sandwich panel with nano reinforcement. And then we observe uh, two types of failure. Uh, one uh, for honeycomb paper, there is like a regular curve, which is also like uh, we, we follow one linear uh, um, increase in strength, and then uh, and as, the, as, the, as the walls start to uh, fold and to crush, we reach a certain maximum uh, strength of the honeycomb. Uh, but in the case of uh, non reinforced sample, there are two failure modes. One is this uh, red curve uh, dashed here, which look, resembles the curve of the honeycomb. It only has a lower stiffness. That's because simply we are using two layers of honeycomb. So the two honeycombs are deforming at the same time. And since the height is uh, bigger, the stiffness of the core will be lower. Uh, but also, there is another uh, failure mode, which is this uh, incremental, uh, which most likely points out that uh, uh, layers in the sandwich panel break sequentially. So we first have the crushing of one layer and then crushing of the other layer. Uh, in the case of uh, reinforced layer of reinforced specimens, we only observe the, the sequential failure. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, nano reinforcement did not contribute in any significant way to the maximum resistance of the panel, uh, but it increased significantly the stiffness. Uh, on the other hand, the sharp impact test shows that um, that the impact resistance of the reinforced specimen is almost uh, twice as big as um, in the case of non-reinforced. And the same um, failure uh, mode and the same um, uh, problem as in the case of three-point bending is observed here. So we have high delamination, we have small denting, and none of the two phenomena are present here in the reinforced specimen. This is the ongoing uh, procedure now in, in Minion, uh, where we are producing the steel Nomex honeycomb panel. And uh, we have prepared specimens for a lab shear test, and we prepared specimens for tensile test of the epoxy matrix to prove that um, our uh, epoxy that we are using uh, for fabrication of panels uh, reaches the specified uh, strength by producer. So we were, it was written that, that the maximum strength should be around 50 megapascals, and we can see that, uh, that specimens are corresponding to the specification. Uh, here, on the other hand, uh, we tried several techniques how to apply the epoxy to the steel surface. We tried the rollers of different types. We tried using a spatula. We tried using a pure um, epoxy. And we tried also increasing the roughness of the surface by sanding it. 
Uh, in the case of a very uh, low viscosity epoxy, this is the failure that we got, and this is not satisfactory. In the lab shear test, only this kind of failure is acceptable, and we have uh, reached this failure by adding um, silica filler. So silica filler increased the um, density of uh, the viscosity of the, of, the, of the matrix, of the polymer, and it improved the bonding between the two surfaces by preventing, first of all, absorption of the aramid paper uh, of, the, of the epoxy. So that was the problem here. Uh, it was very low viscosity and epoxy as a fabric, it absorbed a lot of, uh, a lot of epoxy. So there was very little epoxy left on the, on the surface. And on the other hand, it changed the properties of the, of the paper. So here we can see the failure of the epoxy hardener and silica filler. And here we see the failure of epoxy and hardener without silic. So we have a, just a slippage here. There was no response of the, of the core. Because also the filler filled the voids of the honeycomb, not filler, the epoxy filled the voids of the honeycomb. And uh, for this reason, the strength, of course, of the honeycomb in shear was much higher than if the voids were empty. So after defining the blast uh, uh, laboratory testing part, we are now moving to the third part of the presentation, which deals with the blast testing. So at the mechanical department, uh, there is a laboratory that has been performing different types of uh, uh, blast tests and studies on energetic materials for the past three decades almost. And here I found in the literature that they have published, um, tests which are helpful in design of my own setup. Uh, first of all, in 2007, 2007 uh, Professor uh, Kampusch and his colleague Igor Plaksin uh, developed a small blast wave generator. Uh, that, so they put a bit of explosive in a water container and then they developed their own um, uh, instru instrument. So they put an um, aluminum plate, which was connected to the steel rod, and they had here a copper uh, roller blind that was covering the optic fibers, and they had a light source on top. So they were able to measure uh, uh, the, the velocity of the, of the bar, which was set in motion by the, by the shock coming from the blast wave generator. So with this, they were able to study, as I said, the detonation wave performance of charges that they used, which was plastic bone explosive. They studied the shock wave attenuation through the water domain, and then they studied also the effect of this stand of distance between the obstacle and the blast wave generator. Other types of studies were so-called uh, aquarium studies, where water container is used, and then explosive is placed in the middle, and then pressure is evaluated at the edge of the water container. So they have used different types of um, uh, volumes. Here we see one cubic meter uh, water container, and this is a 30 liter container. For this purpose, they also developed their own instruments. Here they have one uh, plate, and inside they have some certain set of tubes that they measure the pressure. And another device is here below. Uh, so this was helpful because in my study we are also using this uh, blast wave generator and it was also very helpful to understand how the shock transmits through water. So in order to decide what is the size of this uh, water container and what is the amount of explosive and type that we need, the first there was a preliminary study with a single uh, plate um, which was placed over the polyurethane board of a very, very low mass. So this then resembles a plate which is suspended in the air. And uh, here the plate is subject to a blast impact with also PBX charge which was placed within this small container. There was no instrumentation, so only the size of the crater is measured after. And I used the size of this crater later to uh, help define my own instrument for the experimental test. I will, you will see it in the following pictures. So in the present configuration, we are not anymore that interested in the propagation of shock through the water and, uh, and performance of the detonation charge itself, because that was defined in the previous studies. 
Here we are analyzing the panels that uh, I presented previously. So this is uh, a strong support below. So here comes another beam, so it closes this. And inside the box, we will be placing here various types of instruments. Um, uh, electro, electro contact uh, instrument and one hopefully optical, optical solution. Um, and here you can see the assembled uh, su support. So the plate in this case, or the panel is placed in between two uh, steel frames. And then we use a set of clamps to fix the two frames. So it is uh, fixed along the uh, edges. Uh, next thing which is important to define in this um, uh, setup is an instrumentation because we are dealing with very fast loads and uh, common data acquisition is not uh, fast enough to capture the movement uh, of the plate and the initial velocity that we need to uh, validate our model. So we need to develop uh, our own uh, instruments. For this purpose we thought of uh, electro contact method with pins and wires and uh, also about adapting uh, optical active method developed by a colleague Jana Karajma from uh, mechanical department. Uh, her technique for, it was uh, used for study of very high velocity, so she was analyzing detonation uh, explosive charges and uh, uh, detonation propagation within this uh, cylinder. Uh, so the velocities here are in thousands of kilometers per second, and here we expect uh, order of magnitude less. So we expect uh, around 100 to 200 uh, meters per second. Um, so how we thought of this is to, first of all, uh, what do we see on this drawing? <laughs> uh, the bucket on top represents our blast wave generator. Then we see here the cross-section of the, uh, the setup I showed on the previous slide. And in the middle, we have uh, pins, four of them. We only see two because we see them in cross-section. Uh, behind these two, there are more two. And these pins are on a known distance from the surface of the plate. And these pins are connected to electrical circuit, which is connected to the oscilloscope. Uh, I prepared a small uh, uh, simulation of this test on a breadboard, so using uh, uh, electric source, using uh, oscilloscope, and a set of resistors and capacitors. Uh, so what do we see here as a result of uh, this study? So this, as I mentioned previously, we have four pins. Here we have four wires, one, two, three, and four. Each one of them represents a pin. So whenever there is a contact between the oscilloscope and the pin, we can read a discharge uh, of, the, of the capacitor. So in order to calculate the velocity of our specimen, uh, we need to know uh, the time. That is the only thing we measure. So we measure the, the contact, the point in time when the plate makes contact with our uh, device. Uh, so we have point contact T0, which is T1, T2, T3, and T4. And we then, the information, we can calculate the change of movement, we can calculate the velocity, we can calculate the change of velocity, we can calculate the initial acceleration of the plate. Um, in the other configuration, so we have pins, but we also have wires. We have pins because it's very difficult to put wires horizontally close to the plate. This is something like 15 millimeters. But pins can be part of millimeters. We can put a 0 0.2 or 0 0.4, which is almost like touching the plate. And we will have also a set of horizontal wires to see the deformation in the later stages. And I previously mentioned the deformed shape of the plate from the uh, preliminary study of the plate, which is this deformed shape. So based on the, some simulations performed and these preliminary uh, tests, we can expect a certain deformation of the plate and we can expect until where we need to place our instrument safely. Uh, this um, technology, we plan to adapt to this um, setup by also passing the optic fibers. So instead of passing optic fibers through the explosive mixture, we will place our uh, optic fibers in parallel to the, uh, to the wires. So we will, able, we will be able to validate optical uh, method with uh, electrocontact and electrocontact with um, optic. Uh, so optical, for, for the optical method to work, so we need optic fibers, we need the lasers, we need the opto-electronic converter, 
we need a high acquisition uh, oscilloscope uh, and uh, we need uh, adapters. So here you can see the scheme, but most likely it's not big enough. So this represents a laser, this represents the optic fiber. Then we have the converter of uh, light into electronic signal. And then we have a connection with the oscilloscope between the converter. So oscilloscope reads electronic signal. So the fourth part, the third part of the presentation is uh, modeling. In order to model uh, this combustion process, which happens inside of the um, energetic material, once detonated, uh, we, uh, finally now you see one equation. So for those who were missing equations and not enjoying my pictures, there is uh, an equation. Uh, this is, um, it is important to define the relationship between pressure and uh, expansion. So what is expansion is the change of volume or the change of density. So it is uh, one over volume gives us density or one over density gives us volume. Um, what happens in the phenomenon of shock is uh, uh, when the shock passes through the uh, material, at the contact between the shock and material, there is an increase of density because the shock is, uh, moves faster than the, much faster than the speed of sound. And uh, um, in this area, the density of material, as you will see later, is higher than the initial density of material. And uh, there is a change of density. So as the material expands, uh, the pressure drops because the, uh, the, the combustion produces the uh, detonation products, the, the, ga the gases, the gas. So the, the higher the gas, the, if you go to infinite volume, there will be almost zero pressure. It will be ambiental pressure. So how we calibrate this uh, empirical equation of uh, jones wilkins Lake? As we can see, it has five parameters. Uh, so how do we choose five which represent the real situation? Uh, we can either calibrate this equation using uh, experiments, so using uh, cylinder tests, or if we don't have access to cylinder tests, we can use something called uh, the thermochemical codes. Um, and in thermochemical uh, Thermodynamic, uh, thermochemical codes such as TOR, uh, we are able to define adiabatic and isotropic expansion, uh, which I can later describe in more detail if someone is interested, uh, to calibrate different parts of this equation. And then with, def with this defined equation, we can go to modeling in commercial uh, explicit uh, uh, dynamic software. So here I have just an example of these two curves. So we can compare JWL with theoretical pressure curves obtained from TOR. And uh, so the initial part here is uh, adiabatic, then we follow here is entropic, and the, everything is a logarithmic curve. Uh, and the orange curve is the empirical one. And so with this uh, set of parameters, we go to autodyne. Autodyne, we can do simulations in 2D or in 3D. Um, 2D is much faster. It allows us to see the propagation of the detonation wave. We can see the attenuation of the, of the shock through different uh, uh, domains. And we can see the interaction between the obstacle and the shock. Uh, in this specific example, we have ampho explosive. We have some water, which represent our water, represents our water bucket. We have air. We also have a small stand of distance uh, between the bucket and the plate. And the red uh, line represents the steel. Uh, so, but it is hard to analyze the response of an element in 2D. So another approach we can use is 3D. Uh, in this specific study, uh, I used uh, the deformed shape from the preliminary study of the plate to compare it with the um, uh, numerical model. And here we see the one quarter of the plate. We see here the water bucket, which is simply here presented as a square, so not really as a cylinder. Uh, the red area is uh, ex explosive material. And here we have a deformed quarter of the shape. And here you can see the simulation uh, of a whole piece um, and how the expansion of, and you can see the expansion detonation products. So when I was talking about expansion detonation products, uh, this is what happens. So the volume increases, the pressure reduces. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Damien, for your presentation. Very interesting, very complete. Uh, you, have, you have been doing a very good research till now, and uh, 
it's promising. So, as far as I understood, the, the typical way of building a, a blast protection wall is by using a, a corrugated plate, right? Yes, yeah. either corrugated plate or using a steel plated stiffeners. Are you, are you thinking to compare uh, the behavior of this corrugated plate with your uh, composite panel? Or for, uh, panels? Some studies were done the past and they showed that already sandwich panel outperforms. So there are different solutions of sandwich panels. So I chose three, but in literature it's possible to find cores which are made of pyramidal truss which are made with um, uh, folded, um, uh, folded profiles that are made with tubes, that are made with foam. So yeah, different, yeah. different various solutions exist. So whether I would try to compare uh, initial, in the initial stage of the work, I was modeling just the pure plates and, um, uh, but in the tests, we won't be examining those. So to compare them, maybe it will be possible numerically, uh, otherwise, uh, for this stage of work, it is not intended. The idea was to have such a benchmark that you mm -hmm. can compare and to understand the, the improvement. Yeah, yeah, I understand. We, what we are using, what we are using, a simple uh, single plate. So we we will have a system of a, a one millimeter thick uh, panel, like a plate. Then we will have a system of two plates. Uh, then uh, two plates in different configurations, one on top of the other, so we have a plate of uh, two millimeter. We also have a plate of two millimeter, so we will have a configuration of two millimeter on top of two millimeter, so we'll have a plate of four millimeter. So that will serve us as a benchmark to see, because um, by putting more steel on top, we are increasing the weight and increasing the thickness. But if we are able to put a light material in the core, and increase the thickness that way, and then just have uh, sheets made of steel. We will significantly reduce the weight of the element, and uh, that is probably beneficial. So the idea is to use this uh, solution as a, as a cladding. For example, if we imagine offshore platform that has a certain blast wall already designed, but I don't know capacity increases or uh, or there is an increased risk of higher pressures that is maybe calculated later on. Uh, how can you improve it without now taking off the entire structure? Maybe you can just apply another cladding layer on top without increasing a lot of the weight of the structure. So, or you can apply it as, as a shell in a shelter or wherever you need a light solution. It is commonly also used in uh, maritime industry, like in for ship design and stuff like that. And you have three types of sandwich panels, right? Yeah. Uh, One was like a um, pure metallic, like mm -hmm. a steel and aluminium foam. Another one is uh, steel sheets and honeycomb. This one, steel and aluminium foam, is, is a product from the market, right? Yes, we received from uh, Professor Odina's colleagues uh, in Italy. But uh, did you already test it and compare with yours? Or? No, no, no. So last tests, we are uh, still waiting for the laboratory uh, to enter in a working conditions because they have construction works already for almost a year. So for this reason, we are a bit delayed. And but it is expected to happen in the What do you expect uh, to be the difference between a steel plate and an aramid plate? Do you have any idea what could be the benefit? Uh, well, what, what, how the honeycomb, what we ex expect to add to the, uh, to the response is it provides, it provides a distance between the two plates. Um, so it will resemble something like a flyer plate. But flyer plate is a plate impacting another plate. Uh, and, it and as I mentioned before, it's very, providing distance is always very useful. So uh, we expect to have a, a lower indentation of the, of the lower of the back plate. So the, the first plate, which is closer to the impactor, to the blast wave generator, will deform much more, and then it will deform, it will bend, and it will travel this distance where that uh, honeycomb is providing, and then impact the back plate. And we expect that, a low, that the back plate um, experience is lower than formation than it would initially experience if it was just exposed to a direct blast. So it's the same effect as a cladding would have. So you are protecting your initial structure with a sacrificial cladding on top. 
So in this case, our front plate behaves as a sacrificial cladding for the back plate. And one important part is the adhesive, right? Is the it? Adhesive, adhesive, yes, yes. So you have epoxy resin and you have silica and nano reinforced part, right? Yes. These three solutions. We try these three. Uh, for the case of uh, steel uh, anomics, we are not using nano reports because we are doing it in different laboratories. I don't have access here to nanoparticles. Um, but maybe it would improve the bonding uh, based on the experiences from Serbia. It, it improved bonding between the fabric. I am not sure if it would improve the bonding between the steel. Uh, if we follow the same logic, it should, but uh, I did not try to, to answer that, so that, that, that answer that question. Because uh, these particles did not uh, react, but they provide certain uh, uh, interaction, like on the molecular level, and uh, they improve the um, contact between the face and the core layer. So uh, I, I, I would expect it would also improve in this case. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I just advise you to put some schematic representation of each panel, like. Uh, type of panel and the legend of each layer to be clear uh, the types of panels that you are okay. um, can, can you go to this slide set number seven? This one. First solution. So the third picture here, you have... This one here? Yes. Two. Two layers of honeycomb, right? Yes, On it's, 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 a, it's a tandem, yes. So we have face, honeycomb, then middle layer, honeycomb, face. Ah, so you have several layers, several aramid. Yes, because we want to have a bigger thickness. Uh, not to have only two millimeter thick panel, but to have four millimeters. And by providing a middle layer, we also improve the contact between the two honeycombs. And also in, in initially improve the, additionally improve the strength. And what is in the middle of this? This one? Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, I got the same question from a reviewer in the paper. So uh, this is just a paper below. So uh, if this is, the picture is taken by a small microscope, so we can better see the, the, the structure in here. But the specimen is placed uh, vertically on top of the white surface. And probably since this is white, it shines. But um, there is nothing, just an empty space. And the first picture is the... First picture is the, this fabric, but uh, impregnated with uh, epoxy, actually this, this, this epoxy. So a uh, combination of nanoparticles, which are here, and uh, these two components, epoxy and PVB. So these three together form this mixture, and then this mixture is applied on top of, the, uh, on top of each layer. So we impregnate every layer with uh, with um, uh, matrix. This technique is commonly used for production of prepregs, prepregs which are like a laminated uh, fabric uh, composites. And uh, slide nine. So you have three point three point bending. Yes. Um, what was the failure mode? Was it uh, in the honeycomb? Was it in yes. The uh, well, here uh, we had like a multi failure mode. Uh, we had uh, uh, debonding. We had a failure of the honeycomb ball. Uh, we had uh, also some local indentation uh, here. Um, in the other case, it was uh, it was just honeycomb, but in this one, it was more complex. You have an improvement because this uh, is also due to a probably a worse bonding between the sheets and the honeycomb. Here, we proved like this also that adding nanomaterials, nanoparticles, improves the bonding between the two layers. And compression. I mean, maybe you can see better here. As you can see that this uh, top surface separated from the honeycomb, which means that there is a poor bonding. And here you can see better, yeah, you can see the crack. 
through the Honeycomb wall. So there was also uh, probably a shear due to uh, a, lo a local uh, when when the loading when the, uh, lo when the loading head was pressing the, um, uh, the specimen. Uh, that's where the this vertical crack also appeared from shear. And this compression test, they are out of. It's just a crushing test, yes. So in, you can use the same tensile machine, but just in, instead of pulling, you compress the specimen. And uh, this was done according to uh, ASTM standards, so uh, it, it's specified. I was wondering if it is for in-plane compression or... Ah, no, this is uh, out-of-plane compression. Out of so we are, we are compressing uh, over the honeycomb, yes. The yeah. uh, in the way how we expect our panel to respond. Under impact, yes. Slide 10, I think you already respond. I was, yes, I, I saw the results of tensile tests and I was wondering what, if there is a need to test other uh, adhesives, what would be the goal of testing the, ten, this ten, these uh, adhesives in tensile? What is the, the goal of tensile testing this? Just to prove uh, their strength and to prove that we are combining them uh, in the right way because you need to put uh, epoxy and uh, hardener in a specific ratio and to prove that the material was stored properly, that we are mixing it properly uh, and that we are curing it also properly, which is even more important. Uh, we, have, uh, we have specimens which are cured under ambient temperature and we have the specimens which are post-cured. So this was important for us to determine, to find out whether we need to post-cure the panels as well or not. Luckily, we got basically the same uh, range of uh, uh, responses uh, for cured and post-cured. So this proves that we do not need to post-cure the specimens of, of panel, big panels. We can just put them in the climatic chamber under the uh, ambient temperature, 20 degrees. We do not need to go up to 40 degrees or something like that. So you are satisfied with it's the results exactly. from the... I'm, I'm happier because I don't need to spend more time curing the specimens. And I do not need to book another uh, climatic chamber, which is very important. In terms of mechanical properties, you are satisfied? Yeah, with we, we are satisfied because they all achieved the uh, prescribed uh, strength. And there is no prescription about uh, young models, for example, or... Uh, we have a range of young models. Now I don't have here the information for the coefficient of variation, but um, um, there is always a range because there is always a certain slippage as well in the clamps. Um, this also took a bit of time to figure out which clamps work the best. Uh, we tried, for example, to roughen the surface a bit with uh, sanding paper. Then we tried to, uh, with one set of clamps, other set of clamps, we even tried to like glue steel plates to increase the thickness in the contact. And in the end, we found uh, one, clamps, one, one set of clamp, clamps which uh, performed the best. So maybe also the, some variation comes also from the slippage. So the, the stiffness will be lower if the element uh, moves a bit. Uh, so this, the, the young modulus is not specified. All at the, in the, specific, in the data sheets. Uh, and about this last testing, have you already performed uh, some tests on, on panels? No, uh, we only have these uh, initial uh, ones, uh, which are done in the same uh, configuration by Professor Kampsch, and he shared with me the results, so it was not me who directly did it. Uh, he did it and then gave me the, uh, the information, uh, and this also helped uh, design the setup. So, we expect the works to be over at the end of this month, they told me last time, and then they need some time to organize the space in the laboratory. So they're in the big construction works, for this reason it's... Uh, it's and it. then you will test uh, these sandwich panels? Yes, in, in this configuration here. So where you, you can see the horizontal, the, the cross-section of the... This is a single plate, just for an example. And here then we, will, we have also some free space for thicker elements. So we will have um, these three panels tested. Three, three panels and uh, single plates. So we have single plate of one millimeter, single plate of two millimeters, and combination of uh, these two to increase the thickness. To see how 
the increase in um, specimens uh, thickness uh, improves the response and then how it relates to the solutions that we are proposing. Because if they give the same uh, response, of course, you would probably want to have a lighter solution instead of having uh, something which is like know, as heavy as steel. It's better to, it's easier to get. At the study that you are performing uh, up, after this, the finite element model, is not for this solution, right? But the one that I performed was for this here. Ah, with water? Yeah, well, with water and suspended plate. Thank you for the explanation. Okay, right. yeah. Thank you. Now, Thanks for the questions. Uh, yes, Roger, sir. Uh, no, no. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, first of all, it's a very simple research. And probably, uh, from my moment, my moment, from the numerical part of the integration. And uh, on the final part, you talk about. This one? Uh, okay, we are. Okay, yeah, let's start. Yeah, be tall and how it okay. I mean, uh, whichever, uh, whenever you have a question. Please, for if I understand that correctly, talk uh, <coughs> about an autodemon are two alternative. Uh, no, 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 they are completely different. So, Tor is not a finite element uh, program at all. It's a theoretical code, it's, it's thermochemical. So uh, it uh, uses uh, physics to calculate uh, various sets of uh, expansion curves. So you can have uh, expansion with constant pressure, with uh, constant entropy, with const with, uh, without heat uh, um, uh, exchange with the uh, ambient. So why is this important? Uh, when we look at this um, expansion curve, this is in uh, logarithmic scale. So the, the experimental tests when, where the equation is calibrated usually goes up to five expansions. So five expansions is five initial volumes of the material that you, that you get. Um, in the first few expansions, up to probably two or three, it is expected that material is um, uh, deforming so fast, so it's expanding so fast, that there is no time for heat to be exchanged with the environment. With the, uh, environment. So we assume adiabatic process. So uh, for this, in TOR it's possible to set uh, certain conditions and to obtain pressure expansion conditions when there is no heat exchange, so for the adiabatic conditions. And we use this to calibrate the initial part of the curve. So this is the this is here, I have here P theoretical. So it's a P from Tor and theoretical curve. We have actually two curves. There is one adiabatic here, there is here isotropic. So adiabatic is important in the first stage because that's where we don't expect to have a heat exchange. But then, uh, it's in the later stages, as it goes to infinity, it is more um, uh, realistic to assume that, there is, uh, that entropy is constant. So we define these parameters based on the two set of curves, uh, one adiabatic and one isentropic pressure expansion from Tor. And then it's possible to do fit, uh, curve fitting, and we determine the five parameters. So Tor is a purely theoretical code. It has nothing to do with the finite element modeling. Uh, I put it under the finite element modeling as it is an initial step in the, in the modeling. Uh, in order for me to, uh, in Autodyne, define the explosive, I need this JWL equation. I need JWL parameters. And for me to define them for the explosive mixtures that I'm using, uh, I can, instead of performing cylinder tests, I can run Tor code analysis. And in Tor code, if I know the composition of the material, if I know the initial density, and if I know something called energy of formation, which is a quantitative substance that is uh, released or, 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 or generated when the constituents of the materials are placed in the compound, uh, are known, and these three values are known, the, the code can calculate the expansion curves. And then you use these expansion curves to determine the JWL for autodyne. So, so if 
Yes, expansion curves. I can ex so with these three inputs, uh, okay, you also need to define what are the outputs of the combustion process and so on. But uh, you can determine this block, this block, these two blue curves, and then you use these two blue curves to calculate the orange one, and then you use uh, the orange one in the in the autodyne. But the code is open box or open box? Uh, is it open source? No, 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 it's not. It's not. It's, it's developed by colleagues at the mechanical department. Okay. They use it. So if you need to change some, uh, I need to talk to them. You have to speak with yes, so they, 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 they authorized me to use it, and also it's possible to work with the code through sets of uh, text files. So I don't even need to really run the, the code itself. I can use the text files that I have in my folder and just run exe file. So I have sets of input data. And I have an exit file. So I can vary on my own uh, different text files, different inputs, and then just uh, run the code again. And it will generate me curve every time, a new curve every time I run the execution file. Any other questions? Okay, so because it's one o'clock. Open.